And she's supposed to be dead? Alrighty. Shadow Hearts conquered! Ah. Alright. Excellent. Um... I, I would have to admit that I am... I am not, uh... too pleased with that ending. Um... Uh, Psycho Reaper is saying to watch the full credits, so maybe there's a, a scene after the credits that will... Uh, elaborate a little bit more. Uh, there's a lot of answers that I would like to have. But uh, we'll go through my thoughts for right now, and then uh, if something happens, you know, we'll interrupt that. Uh, so my overall thoughts, I like the game. <laughs> uh, I think it's a bo uh, it's extremely bold and way out there, especially for a JRPG. It's very unique for its time as well as present day. I was quite quite pleased with this game, actually. Uh, it uh, between like the judgment wheel and. Uh, just kind of like the atmosphere of the game, it really took things in a direction that you don't really see very often in JRPGs, uh, both back then and in today's day and age. So, uh, just experiencing that in of itself was very cool. Uh, I feel it takes so many risks and deviates so far from tradition that I can't do anything but applaud the effort. Modernish daytime? Uh, a creepy horror film-esque atmosphere and imagery alongside an interactive judgment wheel system that is incorpor uh, incorporated not just in combat but in shopping and interacting as well. Uh, there were a few moments where I felt that they didn't really fit all too well, but I would say overall uh, it's, it's still a really nice bit of innovation that you get to experience there. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed the, the inclusions a lot more than than, um, than one might expect, I suppose. Uh, I do think it lost its way, though. As the game progressed, it became less about the strange, occult, creepy places with gruesome imagery and basically devolved into typical JRPG storylines. The story, the locations, and interactions all s seem to shift into another genre while the enemy design remains stagnant in its horror look. Uh, the game was going in two different directions and it felt very noticeable to me. I think I mentioned this yesterday as well, uh, that there, there definitely was a split in this game and uh, some parts of the game went in one direction and other parts of the game went in another direction. and. It, it stopped feeling as cohesive as it was initially. Um, yeah. Uh, for story, was it satisfying? Uh, based off of the information that I have right now, I'm gonna kinda say... No? Uh, there's some stuff that I'll get into, but there's... I, I feel like there's too many missing components that I need answers to. Uh, I feel the first half of the game uh, has no answers, and the second half of the game only uh, concludes what happens in that game. There's there's so many things that I need I need clarification on. I mean, not so many things, but I feel like there's important things that need clarification on. Uh, did it feel complete? Uh, I'm gonna say no on that one as well. Uh, for similar reasons that it wasn't very satisfying, I, I think there's... Uh, big aspects that were forgotten about, uh, based off of what I've seen thus far. Uh, and how was the pacing? I would say the pacing was, was pretty decent. I think running around getting new party members and things like that was probably a little bit slow. But overall, I think the game uh, stuck stuck to what needed to be done quite a bit. And it even offered a little bit of a side content as well, which was kind of cool. Uh, thoughts on the story? 
Uh, the game has some extremely creepy moments. The first village really set a dangerous tone for me. Uh, someone who doesn't engage with scary games. Uh, so, I don't play horror games at all. The last horror game I played, I think, was Resident Evil 3. The one with Nemesis in it. And Nemesis busted through a wall, scared me half to death, and I decided that I was never going to play scary games, watch scary movies, watch scary TV shows. I haven't even finished um, Stranger Things Season 1 because of a, a scene where there was a house and a pool, and I was like, you know what, this it, it's not working out for me. So I even I stopped it there. Um, I don't I don't like scary things, and I think this game isn't scary. It's just creepy, and it sets off a really amazing tone of that creepiness at the very beginning. Uh, but as mentioned prior, and as will be repeated most likely, um, it doesn't it doesn't keep that throughout the game, which I think is a detriment because I. As weird as it is to say, I, I liked that kind of aspect that I've never experienced before where I'm playing a really creepy game that's unlike any other game that I've ever played. And I didn't get to experience that all the way through. It was only for a small portion of the game. I'll be quiet in case there's voice acting. As the warlock said in the end, even if another age of storms buffets this world, I intend to go on living and fighting for you who freed me from the darkness, for the one I love. Oh, uh, the Prince of the Ostro, oh my gosh. Hungarian Empire was assassinated. Summer the same year, the Great War I begins. Supposed to interpret that as. So am I am I supposed to assume that she dies on the train? Is is that how that's supposed to work? Or is she just sleeping? I don't know. I don't know. Um now I have, yes, she just did. Okay. Curse of the Four Masks got her. Okay, then before, before I even continue with my thoughts, I have a couple questions for chat. Um, is there a way to save her? Because I got like a grail thing that I thought was going to stop her from dying. Are there multiple endings? Um, can you get all the books? Um, and if you can get all the books, what does that do? Um, and what did I miss? Because <laughs> I think there was a lot of stuff that I missed. Yes, yes, and yes to all. Interesting. So, yeah. While I go through my thoughts, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. If uh, you guys could tell me about um, how I could have gone about doing that kind of stuff, because uh, I I I was very curious and I I thought I was on the right track to accomplishing that, especially after I got that Grail. But I guess it wasn't enough. I want to know who the ultimate fusion is. Absolutely, uh, it is it is free territory to spoil this game now that I have beaten it. So go nuts. Uh, let's see. Uh, back onto my thoughts on the story. Uh, let's see. I think I can say the game has really mellowed out after the first several hours. I don't know if it's meant to be creepy the entire game, but there was definitely a tone shift. So this was written um, like on day two or three or something like that. And I was noticing it then, but it got progressively worse as uh, the game went on. Uh, I like having Roger Bacon be the final antagonist. Uh, it was a nice tiny surprise to beat Dehuai and be like, well, now what? Oh, right! Bacon! 
I, uh, I kind of fell for that. And it could have just been my memory failing me and whatnot. But that was, that was a nice moment for me where I just totally forgot about Bacon. And then he just shows up and he's like, yeah, you forgot about me. I, I like that a lot. Uh, Seraphic Radiance is the uh, ultimate fusion. Interesting. Roger Bacon is the chairman of the lottery. Wow. That's crazy. That's super crazy. That, that must have been a scene. What do you get for the, the, the arena, by the way? I, I want to know that as well. Uh, something strange about the story is there's not much story. But what, uh, but what is there is actually very intriguing. We delve, uh, if we delve deeper into it, the explanation of what's going on uh, are pretty sparse. Forbidden magic and ancient tomes. Uh, we, ne we also never manage to actually fully understand Dehuai. Uh, the Demon's Gate invocation does what specifically? And by reversing it, what did he specifically hope to achieve? Uh, I get a similar feeling with Roger Bacon, or Albert Simon, uh, although we actually get more depth and backstory uh, and, um, and other characters knowing him than they're telling us about that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, to kind of go through that, uh, the, the story is definitely a little, uh, a little sparse on the details. Um, I, I think Dehuai was a great starting point for the villain i wish we got more information about what was going on i wish we got you know a monologue from him and all the other good stuff i kind of feel like when we went to go fight him we just fought him and he died and he didn't really say much or do much and he still got his plan to go off but we still never really got any context around that um and then this to piggyback off of that, I'm over 19 hours into the game and I feel like the game forgot about Yuri fusing with Seraphic Radiance. It was kind of a big deal, wiping out a big portion of Asia and all that. Um, this, this was the biggest misfire for me. Um, the Seraphic Radiance thing was like a... a a, a huge thing that was happening. Um, and it just, it never really amounted to anything in, in my playthrough. And it felt like a huge story element that uh, was entirely necessary to, to have. And I think that's why it doesn't feel satisfying. That's why it doesn't feel complete because the that whole element was 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 too big to forget about um he has basically a god that he is fused with how is that changing him um how is he going to ever overcome it is he ever going to be able to use it uh s questions like that how does this affect all the things that are going on in the story how does this affect roger bacon um i was i was expecting some moment where we we explore that stuff and it just never happened uh and speaking of all that destruction a six month time skip was extremely disappointing uh something as massive as a god being summoned and destruction everywhere uh that is arguably the juiciest part of the game and it's skipped over and forgotten um that was uh, another aspect that was incredibly disappointing as well, because time skips rarely work for me, um, especially in this context, because as mentioned, like that, that's the good part. A god has been summoned and you refuses with it and a big chunk of Asia is destroyed. OK, now what are we going to do like that? That is a. Uh, a huge decision-making process that we never got to take part in. And uh, I, I would have liked to, to do that. I would have liked to escape Asia. I would like to escape the Seraphic Radiance as it's destroying everything and slowly make my way to Europe 
where, you know, we're exorcists. And then once we decide that we're going to be exorcists to find leads on Yuri, then, then we time skip, you know, a couple of weeks, a month or what have you. Um, that would have been fine because that part is not important. It's finding, like, finally finding the leads that are, that are mattering. Um, yeah. Um, all characters get different items. To save Alice, you need to beat the masks through Malice fights after you get the Oath Grail. Then after you beat the masks, you can win the fight against the boss in the graveyard with Alice. You beat that boss, you get the good ending. Interesting. I, I guess that makes sense that I need to um, fight the masks, actually. That's, that's fair, I guess. Uh, am I still going to play Covenant? Yeah. I, I, it's not going to be directly after this game, but um, yeah, I have no, no large qualms about this game. Um, I like this game... Too much to just be like, nah, screw that game. Uh, there is a scene that, uh, that you see uh, a moment about Asia talking to the acupuncturist. I think I remember something similar to that, maybe, possibly. I don't know. I don't know. Um... How much, uh, how different is the good ending compared to the ending that I got? Is, is she just not asleep on the train or, or is it something else? I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, go, go nuts. Tell me everything. Uh, continuing on with my thoughts on the story, uh, Roger Bacon not being Roger Bacon was actually a nice twist. I think they set that up well. Uh, I, I thought this was a, a great twist. Uh, specifically, I was suspecting it. Um, but when it actually happened, I was just like, hey, you know, yeah, I think they did a really good job here. Uh, I, I don't like the name Roger Bacon. Um, but, uh, you know, sure. Uh, Roger Bacon is a very uh, silly Silly guy. Um, so that kind of stuff. Uh, she wakes up. That's it. And the commentary is a little bit different. Okay. Remember Kawashima? Yeah, I forgot about her too. I forgot about her. What's going on with her? Um, I admit Kudelka being revealed to be the voice was pretty disappointing overall. I hope. Uh, I hope the connection with Haley pans out because. If all it is is just a callback to the previous game, I feel like a lot of wasted potential happened here. And uh, I have another note to add to this. I feel like nothing came of this. There was this creepy hook of a voice ordering us around. And by the end of it, it was, well, I hope you live happily ever after with Haley and uh, the other foster children. It felt too much like an Easter egg that was dragged on for a really long time. This was... Uh, incredibly disappointing for me. Uh, we start this game off and we're being, you know, ordered around or suggested, ordered around, what have you, by this creepy voice that's telling us to go places that are super cre creepy, having creepy things happen to them. And eventually we find out, oh man, we now know who the voice is. It's Haley's mom. This is going to be crazy. So we go there, and it's just Haley's mom. She just, she has powers. And, and that was it. Nothing, not, nothing comes of it, you know? Like, it would, I, I was hoping for more, I guess. Um, I, I think they set up something very interesting and, and didn't deliver. Uh, for the writing, there's some juvenile writing that's pretty uncomfortable to read. 
Uh, it mostly revolves around Yuri, but I could do without his comments about weeping, uh, weeping uh, about women sleeping and other innuendos. Uh, they got rid of this uh, again, like the game splits off and diverges. And this was one of the things that they just stopped doing, um, which I appreciate uh, because sure, Yuri's a jerk and sure, Yuri is uh, not a very nice person, uh, but uh, that kind of stuff, I don't think that needs to be in a video game. Um, so for Kawashima, she died in the scene, assassinated by the order of her father. Kato wasn't able to save her. So is that something that you can also influence? Is she like a secret party member or something? I really thought that Kato was part of the, um, uh, the investigation team. And that he was basically, his job was to spy on her. I was really hoping for that. You were not able to save her. Okay, interesting. Uh, for characters, I don't think the game treats the party members very well. Seems like Alice and Yuri are the stars of the show uh, with, uh, with Zhu Zhen. Um, yeah, I don't think Margaret, I don't think Keith, I don't think Haley. Um, I'll really get any character development or time to shine, really, that make them likable characters. Uh, Zhu Zhen, he's basically at the very beginning of the game and we get some nice backstory with him and Yuri's father, which is really cool. And he just kind of, um, he gets uh, quite a bit more development than everyone else. Uh, when it comes to Margaret, we just know that she's basically a spy that works for America, I believe. And we don't really get much more than that. Um, her personality changes a little bit over the course of the game as well. It's not really that consistent. Um, and Haley, uh, I feel like we get some nice scenes about him and his mom, but that doesn't really... It, it, it comes too sudden. Uh, if Haley was with us at the very beginning of the game, I feel like that might have been a little bit more impactful where, you know, as we get closer to finding his mom or closer to the location of his mom, it's, it starts to dawn on him. Holy crap, this voice is so familiar to me. That's my mom. Holy crap. You know, so um, I, I, I wish they fleshed out the, the other characters as much as everyone else. Oh, uh, that's right. Margaret had a small side quest scene. She and Yuri goes to the church to confess. <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that sounds silly. That sounds really silly. Uh, not gonna lie, you totally forgot Haley existed until you played it again. I, 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 think, I think those three characters are very easy to forget about. Um, especially Keith. Keith gets nothing, like absolutely nothing. Uh, what gameplay elements stand out? Uh, I love how plentiful the save points are. It's really cool to see the structure of areas revolve around singular save points, and they appear to always be before a boss fight. I was a big fan of how they utilize these. Um, other than the exception of where, you know, I didn't save and died and... I had to redo everything. Uh, they, they changed their criteria there slightly. Or I just didn't go downstairs. It, we, we, it, probably I didn't go downstairs. Um, it's probably my fault. But um, I, I do like how plentiful the save points are. And I, I like how, how they utilize them. It was, it was great. Uh, instant death is never fun. And Wugui is just unfair. I don't think I need to say anything more than that. Uh, instant death abilities need to not be a thing. And Wugui had a I'm going to kill everybody move. <laughs> uh, the ability to scan enemies for their HP and weaknesses is cool. Hiding that information on bosses, with the exception of element, basically makes the skill useless. Uh, the whole point of it is to be useful. That being said, there is a tell where characters slump over when having low HP. Uh, so it's a cardinal sin for me. To not to uh, to not have a a value an indicator 
or a tell to determine what the a uh, enemy HP is. And uh, I would say technically there is no tell to determine what the enemy HP is, but the slumping over um, is enough of a qualification. You know, you do 90% of the enemy's HP and then they slump over, or maybe it's 80%. I don't know the exact value of what it is, but I'm guessing once they reach 10% HP is when they slump over. That's usually a consistent thing in RPGs. Uh, I like how dungeons have little bonuses for going back into them. Interesting weapons or fusion upgrade reagents. Uh, I, I like this a lot too. It's a totally optional thing. And uh, sometimes they give you like little teasers in little cutscenes and things like that. Just telling you like, hey, you know, if you want to go back, you know, there's a little sparkly here that you might be interested in. So that was cool. Uh, I don't like the malice system. It's not fun having to go into the graveyard to remove malice because if I don't, I just die to the super strong monsters. Uh, yeah, I wasn't a fan of the malice system in the slightest. Uh, it was also a kind of like a pacing breaker in a sense where, you know, I have this goal of, okay, I'm going to go through this dungeon. Oh, well, I guess I fought too many fights. Now I need to go find a save point and go to the graveyard so that I don't die to the next uh, fight. Um, that, that kind of stuff is just obnoxious and uh, it didn't need to be a thing. Um, it also really didn't amount to much in my opinion. Um, it didn't really have any significance to it. Um, I, I, I feel like the malice system could have been incorporated in a different way to make it important or story centric or um have some some sort of mechanic that revolves around it maybe sanity points are are tied to the malice system the more malice you have the less sanity points you have um something like that um do i have anything about sanity points in here i don't think i do um i'm just i'm gonna say that i don't like uh sanity points either um i i think the game uh towards the end utilized it in a very efficient way of making it a, a real threat uh but ultimately i don't think it's a system that uh works out for my personal taste uh, it's not it's not as interesting and it's ultimate, it's basically a timer. Um, and nobody really wants to be on the clock in a fight. Uh, for combat, uh, I enjoy turn-based combats. Or I enjoy when turn-based combats are made a little more dynamic. So having the wheel is a neat idea. I don't like the skew of it, though. I wish it were straight on. Uh, I've mentioned this quite a few times. Um... I like the combat. I like how everything is laid out. Um, I like that you have like spells and then there's fusions with spells and you can, you can kind of like make some really nice customizations. Um, there's a nice variety of items and things like that as well. Um, the, the combat was, was fun and exciting and, and sometimes very tense. Uh, but if, if I were to want an improvement, it would be that the judgment wheel just uh uh if if not straight on then s some other sort of implementation that doesn't offer a a difficult way of determining um how you are influencing the values on the judgment wheel um i ran into this situation so many times it's probably a broken record at this point of me saying I don't deserve uh, that hit or you know I don't deserve that attack or I should have hit that one or that was totally in the red um, all of those situations uh, I feel are moments that probably shouldn't be a thing uh, you know whether it was beneficial to me or a detriment uh, the critical areas on the wheel are extremely underwhelming 
and a heal of 75 HP, I get 20 extra HP. With a buff of 30%, I get 6 extra percent. It's just not worth it. Uh, we talked about this a little bit yesterday as well. Um, I, I personally um, am not very consistent in hitting the critical areas. Therefore, the risk of getting a buff versus not getting a buff is significant. So when weighing a 20% uh, increase on the action that I'm doing, uh, it's just not significant enough for me to consistently seek out a critical hit area. So I, I personally feel that the, the bonus needs to go up. But at the same time, uh, as mentioned be, uh, uh, prior, you know, if, if you're able to hit those consistently, it's just free damage. And at that point, it's, it's, all, it's already meeting the threshold of being extremely beneficial. So um, I, I do understand both sides of the coin. Uh, it's just for my, my own personal taste, um, I, need, I need more of an incentive to want to seek that out. And yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, she confesses about using everyone's power for the French army, but she did not want to anymore. Interesting. Interesting. We, well, I, I was going to say we could have gotten like something story focused for Margaret, but I, I guess that wouldn't have been it. Yeah, the Malice system's only purpose was the chance to save Alice. Um, I, if that's literally the only purpose, then I, I don't think that that is a successful system in my eyes. Um, they, they, they could have done more with it. Um, it it, it could have... I don't have any immediate ideas off the top of my head, but you can kind of just think about this Malice system, and it would be an interesting idea to be able to balance malice with some other type of system. Maybe the more malice you have, the stronger your summons are, but obviously you're going to be fighting uh, more obnoxious uh, monsters with the chance of the masks or Huga or something like that. Whereas, you know, the lower, uh, maybe your, your summons are, you know, normal power, but obviously uh, you're fighting normal type enemies and um, something along those lines. Like the malice system could have been a significant element of the game. And in some respects, it was just kind of an obnoxious afterthought. Uh, for dungeons, I don't really have anything specific to say about dungeons. I feel like I never have anything specific to say about dungeons anymore. Um, I was thinking about removing that section from future things, but sometimes I have things to say about dungeons. So, um, there was nothing that was inflated by backtracking or practical dungeon design issues. Uh, for Cardinal Sins, uh, removing a key party member without sufficient replacement. Uh, this happened quite a bit. Um, I, I almost didn't want to count Zhu Zhen, uh, splitting off from the party at the very beginning, but... Uh, they got rid of Alice, you know, here and there. Um, they, uh, split the party, uh, a bunch of times. Uh, it, it's just not fun for me. Just, just let me play the character, the characters I want. You don't, the story never needs to necessitate splitting the party. It, it just doesn't need to happen. Uh, forcing the player to use certain party members, uh, this was also just an annoying thing for me. Uh, even though it was extremely brief in the final dungeon, uh, having a level 26 Zhu Zhen while everyone else is level 40 or higher, uh, rough times. Uh, just considering that there, there could have been, like in the moment, just thinking, oh my gosh, I gotta go through who knows how much of this dungeon with a character that's basically going to get one shot. Um, and if he gets one shot, then, you know, there goes all my resources into him. Uh, rough times. And backup party earns less experience. 
Uh, we've talked about this uh, prior, and I'm sure we all know my feelings about this, but I feel that backup party members should get 100% experience because it encourages players to choose whoever they want for any given situation. Um, maybe in that final fight there, maybe I was, maybe I was thinking, okay, you know, maybe I don't want uh, Keith in the party. Maybe I do want Haley in the party for that third heal opportunity, but also for some little bit of damage. But it's, it's never really an option when your characters are solo level. So uh, those are my thoughts on that. Uh, on to the miscellaneous for sound and music. I admit none of the music really stood out to me. Uh, this was written, um, I think, two days ago. I like some of the, these ending boss tracks and things like that. Some of those were really good. Um, I'm not a fan of the battle theme, and everything else is just dark, moody, atmospheric music. It's not my style. Um, I would clarify that I wasn't a fan of the first battle theme, the one that's prominent in the Asia section of the game. Um, the European section of the game was more to my liking. Um, I didn't have any problems with that one. Uh, for voice acting, the little voice acting in the game, it's not great in some areas. It's uh, really funny when it shouldn't be. Uh, going back to the, uh, the Lili town and the uh, splush and the splats and the, and the squishes. Uh, some, some silly voice acting moments in this game. <laughs> um, that, that probably are not there for comedic value, but oh my goodness, was that funny. Um, for graphics, uh, I think the graphics were fine. Um, I think it was a little more horrified, horrific horror vibes than I personally would have liked. Um, and knowing that the game continues with that look for enemy design, but doesn't really carry that over to the environments, um, after a certain point and characters and story and things like that. Um, I do wish that the enemy design evolved with the rest of the game so that we weren't fighting crazy looking demons and things like that. Um, it started not making too much sense as, as well. Not that there was any explanation for it regardless. Um, but I like the look of the game. Um, I, I think it looks pretty good for a PS2 game. So cool. Uh, replay value, does the game offer additional story content in a second playthrough to warrant playing the game again, such as Fire Emblem Three Houses as an example? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think by playing this game again, I'm going to embark on a different journey to see different story content and things like that. It seems like it's going to be the exact same story. Um, you know, as chat has outlined, there's probably there's some scenes that I have missed. Uh, there's different endings and things like that. But I don't think that uh, that content there is warranting a second playthrough from from my point of view. So I'm going to say there's no replay value on this one. You can play it once or I, I, I would play it once and and feel satisfied with that. If the developer is watching. I'm actually a fan of the game. It does some uh it's it does some cool stuff that's pretty different from other games out there. Yeah, I I, I really like that this game is is just different. It it takes risks, it does things that no other game has probably done in the PS2 era. Um it embarks in a, a setting that is extremely uncommon. And um it is just overall a fantastic JRPG that I really wasn't expecting uh, this type of, uh, I guess, gameplay and, and um, experience. So uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I do think the game lost its vibe as Dehuai started becoming a more prominent villain. It started off uh, super creepy and devolved into something far from it. Ultimately, I guess the story evolved out of the art direction and nothing was done to rectify that. Uh, I've mentioned this several times already. Um, I, I do think there was some sort of miscommunication along the way or, or that was just the plan and 
whatever the case it was, uh, it it's noticeable for me, and I wish it was different. Uh, in the sequel, I want a few mechanical things. Ultimately, I enjoy the creepiness and even encourage the game to stick with that more. However, I would like the combat wheel to be flat and straight on. I personally would like to see sanity points removed entirely and a removal of the graveyard system. Uh, and when I say graveyard system, uh, I'm mostly talking about the malice system in this case. Um, I didn't necessarily mind going to the graveyard to uh, get new fusions and things like that. That that was fine. I'd rather go to the graveyard than go to some other place on the map that I need to travel to that might be more obnoxious than just visiting a save point. So, um, yeah, those I think those would be the things that I would like to see in the sequel. Um, and if I were to say anything about the story, I would just say I would hope it would be a little bit more consistent with the creepiness if they keep the creepiness. I would like them to keep the creepiness. I think uh, that's a, a big part of why Shadow Hearts is Shadow Hearts to me, uh, even though, you know, it, it stops doing that. But that was that was one of the draws of why I wanted to keep playing the game is because like, holy cow, this is creepy, but it's not scary just creepy and that's cool um so yeah um to reiterate my overall thoughts i, I like the game a lot i i think it does some cool stuff and i definitely can't wait to play shadow hearts covenant in the someday future um and maybe even uh the third game third game and maybe even the first first game which i'm just gonna call game zero the kudelka game I uh, might even be interested in playing uh, those ones as well. So, uh, yeah, I think that will sufficiently wrap up my thoughts on Shadow Hearts. Woot. There is that. Uh, my controller turned off. I want to save. I definitely want my playtime. Hey, 28 hours. Okay, okay.